Hello Internet. Ever heard a song and thought, wow, that sounds exotic, I wonder where it's from? The answer might be more complicated than you think. So what is world music exactly? It seems like a simple enough question, you could probably take a stab at an answer. It's music from different parts of the world, right? Well, not exactly. To answer this question fully, we have to look at globalization. And to do that, we have to talk about empire. But not the obvious kind. Well, sort of the obvious kind. But also a second type of imperialism. Intimately linked with the term world music are notions of cultural imperialism. This is very much an offshoot of actual imperialism, with the main focus shifted away from physical and overt domination of people to domination and often eradication of their culture. An extreme example of this can be found in Australia's Stolen Generation, a result of a policy of re-socialising their Aboriginal communities. As a result of this association, world music has a little bit of a bad reputation in academic discussions. A clue to its links to Western hegemony can be seen in the standard binary between Western and non-Western music. Music enthusiasts once lamented, why is it that we have such a complex network of genres and subgenres for Western music, but only one overarching term for music so diverse and disparate that their only similarity is their non-Westernness? This argument has been thrown around a lot since the 1980s, and on the surface it appears to have some kind of credibility. But like all good little music scientists, we're going to subject that credibility to scrutiny. Are things really that black and white? How non-Western is world music anyway? And what exactly do we mean when we say world music? Let's get a little historical perspective here. According to Martin Stokes, before web and file sharing fundamentally altered the picture in the Western world, a handful of major record companies did indeed dominate the musical landscape. Time Warner, Thorny MI, Bertelsmann, Sony, Polygram, and Matsushita, the majors. At the time, the 1980s, their products included recording artists such as Madonna, Michael Jackson, George Michael, and others. These names were globally ubiquitous, and there were a few parts of the world that hadn't even then produced their own versions of rock, country music, rap, and hip-hop. On the surface, there appears to be some credibility to the cultural imperialism hypothesis, but the idea of a passive listener and the dominant hegemony of the major record labels oversimplifies the reality. The problem with the cultural imperialist view is that it ignores two main factors. That's hybridity and the circularity of musical reappropriation. According to Stokes, Anglo-American dominated pop and rock has always incorporated a variety of African and Latin elements, meaning that its musical effects when returned to Africa and the Latin American world have been complex and varied. So the cultural imperialism model doesn't account for migration, it doesn't account for the circularity of musical dispersal caused by the transatlantic slave trade, which I will remind you is a very, very, very bad thing. So please don't confuse my defense of world music as a defense of slavery. Music of slaves taken from Africa to the Americas was isolated for hundreds of years and blended and evolved over time with Latin American musics. Upon their return, generations later, the descendants of these slaves brought with them new music to Africa. Latin American rumbas have become a staple in much Congolese music as a result of generations of cultural interplay between traditional Central African peoples and those of Latin America. If we really think about it, all Western pop is derived from the interactions between Western Europeans and people from Africa and Latin America and so forth. The enormously oversimplified and certainly not linear progression of Euro-American folk songs, then the introduction of African stylistic elements to cakewalk to ragtime to jazz to blues to rock and roll, Raises the question, isn't all popular music a hybrid of different musical influences? Stokes also raises this point when he suggests that Anglo-American pop comprises densely compacted African, Latin, and Old World European folk elements. African musical practices are of similarly diverse origins, comprising, amongst other things, European elements that go back to the earliest days of slavery, colonialism, and missionary activity. Every element of a hybridized style is itself a hybrid, a bricolage of previous encounters, assimilations, and blendings. But perhaps the main problem of world music is that it isn't actually music from various parts of the world. Not really, anyway. It's normally a mix of several different non-Anglo-American musical stylistic elements sprinkled on top of standard Western harmonies and structures. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm not condemning it for that. What we have to remember is that world music is commodified music. That is to say, it's music that's composed for a market, to be bought and sold as a commodity. And, as a result, it must be saleable. The problem being that what we consider as music is culturally learned, and often we may not hear the traditional musics of other cultures as particularly musical, let alone desirable enough to buy. 
the world music markets are dictated by the strongest global economies. That is, broadly speaking, Europe and North America. Sorry, Australia and New Zealand, but I just can't think of a term that includes you guys as well. And as a result, the music is catered towards what these very similar cultures consider musical. Thus, world music can be described as fundamentally Western pop music with a dash of worldliness to keep things fresh. As sad as that may seem, it's what the markets dictate. But that's not to say that traditional musics aren't being bought and sold, or that there's no market for less openly westernized global musical styles. Some non-Western musics, including many South African genres, have become huge both internationally and nationally. At the foundation of all this, two main questions are forming. Number one, does world music really deserve its criticism? And number two, were its consequences really so dire? Arguments against it state that the world music phenomenon perpetuated a naive and romanticized understanding of parts of the world that the West needs to understand more critically. It may, in some contexts, have demonstrably deepened cultural dependence upon Western markets and tastes of Western consumers. Multiculturalism may often have reduced rich musical traditions to mute tokens of otherness, to be noticed administratively or exploited commercially, but not engaged in meaningful or lasting dialogue. According to Stokes, these are some of the problems associated with the world music phenomenon, and it's no bad thing to draw attention to them. But, he continues, Connections have been made, ideas exchanged, pleasures gained, and everyday music making in local contexts changed in fundamental ways. Cultural creativity on the margins of our own societies, previously invisible and inaudible, have been recognized outside of those margins. We have started to hear our social environment more inclusively. Finally, he states, the normalizing of vastly different musics that resulted from the world music phenomenon lay the foundations on which modern ethnomusicology could thrive. But I want to know what you think. Is world music just further exploitations of the cultures of largely post-colonial developing nations by the world's wealthiest economies? Or does world music open doors to the discovery of musical genres, styles, and subgenres that many would otherwise not hear, while at the same time providing an income for musicians and bolstering music making? And there you have it, world music. Much of what has been discussed in this video can be found in the introduction to Ethnicity, Identity, and Music by Martin Stokes. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to post in the comment section below, and if you want to keep learning about ethnomusicology, musicology, or are just interested in what people think is going on with music, then don't forget to subscribe, and I will see you soon.